Good morning to welcome you here today. As far as a couple of announcements to go over, first off, today is Josiah's birthday, and he has asked his grandmother to have some cupcakes in the back for all of you, so when you leave, please take a cupcake, because that is way too many for us to eat. <laughs> and uh, so those will be in the back, just grab, uh, grab a handful if you'd like, or at least one, and uh, those are for uh, Josiah's birthday, and uh, so that'll be right in the back. If you're watching on uh, line... Yeah, I don't know that the mail will work in this case, so um, you can just imagine, I guess, is how that will work. As well, then, in three weeks, right? Three weeks, Brent Savinsky, Lord willing, will be here, and uh, we encourage you to be here as well. He'll be preaching in the morning service, and then back again at 3 o'clock uh, for kind of a graduation type of service, and we encourage you to stay for both. Um, even some family, I believe, is perhaps not going to be able to make it, um, and so um, it may be us. So please come back if you're able to at 3 o'clock, and uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, May 16th, coming up here very shortly, and as we discussed last week, uh, we're going to be taking a love offering, obviously, and uh, adding that to a set amount, and, and hopefully be a blessing to them as well in that regard. Am I missing anything? I think just about it. As far as some prayer requests, um, Michelle added Dr. Ted Rogers last night, a very aggressive gallbladder and liver cancer. Uh, so we want to continue, continue from last night, but continue on praying for him. Uh, Jim Rourke, I don't know what the, the height would have been, but that's a pretty high fall. The top of the bleachers and then a ladder. The bleachers pushed in and then a ladder on top and fell off the ladder. All, and, Bounce off the top of the bleachers and then down to the ground. I gotta say, the push in the bleachers are probably a good 12 feet, maybe. And I don't know how much higher he was on the ladder. Obviously, the bleachers slowed down the fall to a point. Um, uh, but anyway, he was in the hospital for the whole week. This happened last Sunday. He got out yesterday. And uh, sounds like pain management is not going so well to this point. Uh, so be in prayer for him. Um, and then continue to pray for Lori as well and the girls' Peru trip. Peru right now is still allowing visitors and still sending visitors home when their visits are over. Um, and so, so far, so good. And uh, they have, what, maybe six weeks left, five weeks, six, something in there. And uh, so continue to keep that in your prayers as well. And uh, see the rest of the list, the, the Bakers and Ava and Don Hessen and A.J., AJ was at this morning, well, this morning, for him it was this morning, for us it would have been the middle of the night, for us, uh, but he, they went to, I forget what, Ela, Elam, it's where David and Goliath fought, and sent us some pictures of the battlefield where David and Goliath was, that's, that's pretty cool, just something you do on a Sunday morning, I guess, in uh, Israel, um, as part of their training, I guess. I can't imagine, I mean, if you have to do, if you have to run, if you have to do physical torture, 
I don't know, is that good or bad to be able to do it in places like that? Would that just put a negative connotation for that spot for the rest of your life? Or would it be, well, if I had to do it anywhere, at least this is a cool thing to see. I don't know how it would work. Yeah, so he thought it was pretty cool. Um, but anyway, that's, that's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, the battlefield of David and Goliath uh, would be pretty, uh, it looks pretty uh, rugged. Uh, I can say this, when Goliath would have fallen, it would not have been a fall, a soft fall. We'll say it that way. It would definitely have, the, like Jim Rourke, it would have uh, been rather damaging in and of itself. Nonetheless, do you have any other prayer requests? <laughs> Yes, Jean. They are Christians. Um, I think it's a little, little more su superficial. So I asked her today for her permission to mention it today, and she started to cry. Hmm. Said she would definitely appreciate her for both of them. Yes. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'll go back there. Perfect. Oh. I forget if I shared the praise, but we've been praying for my sister Christy, and she got a job this week. So that's a huge praise. Same, and same I, company. It's the same company. She gets to work from home. It's just another department. So I just wanted to thank you all for praying. And she's just so relieved, and she was thanking people for praying. Yes. Her. Uh, her current job ends May 1st, right? Yeah. So that's pretty close. Yes, this one will just pick up when that one ends. Yes. Sounds very good. And still be able to work from home in the cold state of Wisconsin. <laughs> it's true. Anybody else? Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your constant presence, and certainly while there are those on our list that are going through some pretty difficult times right now, we thank you that you are there, um, that you are more aware of their circumstance, more aware of the future, more aware of the speed bumps, and we certainly are aware, and even they are aware at this point. But I certainly do pray that you be with uh, your Miller's cousin, Gene, and certainly the decisions, the road ahead. Uh, I just pray that you give him strength even through this chemo process and certainly be with the rest of the family as, as certainly they're all going through this together. I, I just pray that you would uh, direct them to the right uh, solutions, the right uh, procedures, and uh, just that you be able to give that health and, and uh, even uh, the strength that is so necessary through this entire process. And even to a point where we're thankful that uh, from Oklahoma, they happen to be not far from Mayo as well, and and uh, we thank you for that arrangement uh, in addition. But I just pray that you be with them even here today. Do ask that you be with my dad with this appointment tomorrow for his eye. I pray that you be able to figure out the solution to this inflammation and, and be able to get that resolved here very quickly. And uh, we thank you for certainly the progress to this point. 
I pray that you be with uh, Dr. Rogers as well, and uh, certainly a, a uh, as well a, a challenging road, some very aggressive cancer. I just pray that uh, you would certainly direct his heart. Um, I don't know the details of, of his position with you, but I, I just pray that you would use this to uh, draw his art, draw his eyes to you, and uh, I just pray that you would be honored uh, through this. Pray that again, as well, that you give him that health that is necessary and the strength, and, uh, and again, I don't know the details of all that his road entails here in the days ahead and weeks ahead, months ahead, but I just pray that um, you would, your very presence would be a constant reminder to him of who you are, and uh, I just ask that you would do again what only you can do. For the other requests, certainly on our hearts, certainly on our, our list there, uh, certainly things that we have been bringing before you, I just pray that you continue to work. I do ask that you be with the entire uh, COVID situation here in our own nation, our own state, but as well even there in Peru as uh, Caitlin and Rebecca prepare for this missions trip, I just pray that you would uh, just coordinate all those details to your honor and to your will, and just that we'd uh, be able to... Uh, um, adjust when necessary to what you have planned for us and we thank you that you are always there and i just pray as well that you be with us as we continue on this morning together as we unite our hearts before you as we look to your word and i pray that you be honored as we do in jesus name amen this time we have special music There's room at the cross and Calvary covered. A uh, good medley there as far as the message for both of those. We want to go to uh, Numbers here this morning again. Numbers chapter, we're going to go over chapters 23 and pretty much chapter 24 as well. And uh, I won't read the entirety of those verses before we start with a word of prayer. Um, but to give you kind of the synopsis of of. Balak attempting to get Balaam to bless them by cursing the children of Israel. And uh, if you recall the event, uh, he tries a number of times, all with uh, increasing failure, we can say it that way. And uh, it reminds me as a, a child, and probably all of us were in this position, I would dare say, as a child, where you ask and you get the, the no answer, so what do we do? We ask again. Uh, let's just try this one more time. And uh, we again, surprisingly, get the no answer. And so what do we do then? Let's give it one more shot. And uh, we, we, we ask one more time. And, and typically a parent, hopefully, 
uh, a good parent will uh, remind the child that they've already got their answer and they need to stop asking. Um, and yet, the same thing applies, I think, sometimes to us as adults. Um, there are things that we wish would happen in our lives, that we pray for in our lives, and they don't happen. And uh, so we ask again, and they don't happen. Or the Lord seems to say no, and we ask again. And uh, I think there's an interesting, is that, would that be a paradox in the Word of God? Certainly we know that uh, Paul prayed for three seasons, thrice. And the, the word there has that idea of, of seasons of time. Whether that season was two days or two months or two years, and then took a break, prayed again. Uh, we don't know if though we don't know the details, but we certainly know that Paul learned to uh, even rejoice in his infirmities. Um, but we also know that there's other instances where we are told to persevere, we are told to endure, we're told to continue on, continuing on. But at the other point, we also know that there's the the other side of the coin where we can't act like spoiled children and just keep asking and asking and asking, hoping that by continuing to ask that the Lord would change his mind. And uh, I think there's a, well, where's that fine line there? How do we know when it is time for us to stop? And how do we know when, obviously, to use Paul's example again, after three times he stopped and he rejoiced uh, after his praying thrice. Um, is three the number? You ask three times. If you don't get the answer you're hoping for, you stop. You know, what, what, what's the paradox? Where's the, where's the line? Where's the, uh, almost a, a contradiction? How do we endure and continue on and, and praying? And we have not because we ask not, and so we continue to ask. And the other side of the coin where we are just trying to get what we want, even though the Lord says, no, this isn't what's best for you. And I don't know that we will effectively... I hope for all of us to answer that question here this morning, but I think this passage has a, 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 good, uh, a good reminder in that regard of at times when it doesn't pay to continue. When we need to learn, uh, the Lord has answered, and uh, I, need to, I, I need to be content uh, with such things that he's given already. Uh, but there's also times where we are to keep asking. Um, my uh, class that I'm taking... Uh, Again, all of the theology-focused classes require uh, devotionals. I don't know if I've shared this before. Uh, someday I may post them on our, our Facebook page. But Maranatham was given a, a uh, print a annual devotional, and they have the grad students do that. Now, how does that work? You have to pay. You have to pay tuition for the opportunity to write a devotional that they will sell in a book. I don't know how this all works out. They seem to be getting. A, they seem to be winning on both sides, and. The students seem to be losing on both sides. Um, but anyway, um, the, I had to do two more for this class that I'm uh, working on right now. And uh, one of them I somewhat uh, uh, devoted to Mr. Cole. It was on the topic of a deacon. And uh, to think of his dear wife who prayed for 40 years. Not totally 40, I think he was in his 40s. So maybe 20-some years because he was I believe 40 when he got saved. So 20-some years she prayed for him, if I got that story right. It seems like he was in his 40s when he got saved. So she probably prayed for him for 20 years. But nonetheless, that's a long time. And I know my grandmother did the same for my grandpa. And uh, uh, here's dear lady just continuing to pray and continuing to pray and continuing to pray. And, and uh, I think the Lord blessed them uh, for their faithfulness in that regard. And uh, I'm thankful for the salvation of, of both my grandfather and certainly Mr. Cole as well. But when do we stop? When do we understand that the Lord has said no, and that's the answer? And uh, we show our contentment, we rejoice in the circumstances, and we move forward to his honor and his glory. And uh, so before we dive into that challenging topic, let's begin with a word of prayer. The Lord, we thank you again for your word. I pray that as we consider, uh, boy, a, a challenging topic, uh, I just pray that you would use me here this morning, allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. While this is not certainly an exhaustive passage on the topic, I pray that we be able to grasp the truth and be able to even consider perhaps at times how often we are like that uh, spoiled child who just continues to ask even though they've already been given the answer. And I just pray that you would use our time together to help us direct our toes in the right direction, that we might move forward after you. And we thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. 
In Luke chapter 5, you don't need to turn there, but in Luke chapter 5, uh, Christ enters the boat of a couple of fishermen. We're told later that one of those boats was owned by Peter. And uh, so he jumps into Peter's boat, and a couple of boats head out into uh, the water, and, and Christ preaches to those gathered there on the shore. And uh, having concluded his time uh, in teaching the masses, he tells them to go out a little farther, and they drop their nets of fish. And you remember what their response was? We fished all night. We got nothing. Uh, it's not the time, not the, you know, and, and see, the, these are seasoned fishermen. Uh, they knew the time, they knew the place, uh, they knew the how, and as far as they know at that point, especially in Luke chapter 5 time frame, they don't know who this is, and uh, for all they know, he's a complete stranger, and he says, hey, let's go out and go fishing. Hey, we fished all night, we caught nothing, this is not the time to fish, on the alley, the middle of the day, this is, this is, not, this is not it, but they do. They do. They obey. They follow the voice of a stranger and drop their nets. Remember what happens? It overflows, yes. Uh, fish galore. And uh, uh, it's amazing to that point. I, I can't imagine as they have fished all night and got nothing. Can you imagine, and I know we've all faced this, although probably not in the, maybe in the realm of fishing, but maybe not. Whatever it might be in our own life, have you ever tried something and worked on it and worked on it and worked on it and uh, nothing? You, you're still not done. If you're a uh, goal-oriented person, those can be some of the most frustrating days. I set out to go fishing. It's my livelihood. It's my means. It's my job. It's my, my profession. It's the way I earn money, and I come back with nothing in the net. But this man tells me at the wrong time, maybe even in the wrong place, to drop down my nets. And although I've told him this is not going to happen, I do it. And the results are overwhelming. Uh, it, it's interesting to consider why it was that Christ did that. Why was it that he told them one more time? If you recall in verse, uh, kind of the end of verse 10, beginning of verse 11, it says that Jesus said unto Simon, fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. When they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Why was, why was it that Christ told them to go out one more time? So they might understand who he was. Drop those nets one more time. I know you completely failed all night. And how many times have they dropped those nets and pulled them up and dropped those nets and pulled them up and had nothing? Do it one more time. With great success. But what was the reasoning? So they would know who he was. And obviously it was enough that they forsook all. They left their nets, they left their boats, and they followed him. And that would begin the course of three, three and a half years uh, in, in following after Christ. In John chapter 21 then, we come to the conclusion of three and a half years. And uh, they're sitting there waiting. Christ has already revealed himself to them, but then disappeared, and, and they're in this waiting time frame. And uh, John chapter 21, verse 3, <laughs> I love Simon Peter when he says, I go fishing. I go fishing. And uh, they said unto him, We also go with thee. So they went and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Remember what happens again in this case. Suddenly there's a man on the shore, as they're seemingly coming into shore. Uh, there's a man there on the shore who hollers out and says, Have you caught anything? No. Well, drop your nets on the uh, left side or right side or whatever it was. And uh, again, I can't imagine. Here they are. They, at this point, they don't know who this is. For their vantage point, this is a complete stranger. They are seasoned fishermen, although seasons with a three, three and a half year, uh, what would you call that, a, a break? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, but they're seasoned fishermen for the most part. Drop your net. Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast their four, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fish. Why did Christ tell them again? Just try it one more time. I think the uh, very next verse makes it clear in verse 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loves saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat onto him, for he was naked, he did cast himself in the sea. We are told, later told that they were about 300 feet out, so... Uh, uh, Peter can't wait 300 feet. He jumps into the water and he swims himself to shore. Why? Because of those four words. It is the Lord. Why did Christ say one more time? Do it one more time. 
Because again, one more time, they needed to hear or see or come to the realization of who he was. I know there's a lot of times in, in life that redundancy can get, well, redundant. Uh, there's a lot of times where you do things something one more time and it just seems like I've done this so many times. Why one more time? In the uh, insurance office, uh, when we're quoting a, a new business, I, I'm in the commercial line, so my quoting involves businesses. I'm quoting a new business. There's a lot of details to, to quote in a business policy. And a lot of times, if we get all the information, we send it out to uh, some of our companies that we contract with, and then we send them out to brokers who to get more companies that they contract with. And, and uh, usually after a set amount of time, I do, a, I know this will surprise my daughter, Caitlin, but I do a little Excel spreadsheet. And uh, here's, here's the quote for, uh, you know, company A, here's their main coverages, here's the premium, company B, main coverages, here's the premium, company C. And then the broker, here's broker one, here's their three companies, and broker two, here's their three companies. And so you wind up with a, quite a list of, here's a bunch of things, and there's never apples for apples. In insurance, there's never apples for apples. Uh, this company offers this that nobody else does, and this one doesn't offer this that everybody else offers. And so you got to kind of compare how that coincides with uh, um, the premium. It always so happens that there's some broker that doesn't get back to you. And, uh, you know, you send them all the information. They come back with some questions. You know, what's the details of this? What's the, you know, uh, some underwriting questions. And look at the answers. And uh, it goes, continues. Back and forth, back and forth, and then I never get a quote. And uh, so when I send this Excel spreadsheet to the boss, uh, here's, you know, you know, broker number three, no quotes. And he'll come into my office, and I know he will come into my office. Hey, so what's up with this uh, uh, broker? Well, I've tried. I've contacted them. I've emailed them. They've asked questions, so I know that they're working on it. Um, but I'm just suspecting at this point that they weren't competitive. A lot of times we have an idea, you know, where they currently are, their premium is X amount. And uh, companies know that if, you know, they can even look at that amount and say, well, we can't beat that. We, we won't be able to beat that. So, the end of story. They don't do any further, and sometimes they don't even contact me. And so, that's many times what it is. And uh, you should know as well, for the backstory of this, that before I send this to John, if there's anybody that has not answered, I will try one more time. I'll pick up the phone and say, hey, how's it working? And sometimes I'll get an answer, sometimes I won't. Well, you know what always happens when John comes in my office? Why don't you just go ahead and contact them? Like I've, I literally just got off the, and you can't argue with them. Like, all right, I'll, I'll try one more time. And uh, as you're dialing the number, you think, I literally just talked to this person literally 42 minutes ago. And here I am again. Hey, this is Art again. And I was just making sure that uh, your previous answer was still on hold uh, because the boss told me to ask you one more time. <laughs> how, how does one, and sometimes you begin to think, uh, as me personally, I don't really want to have to pester them one more time. I don't want to be that guy one more time. Uh, they've already heard from me endlessly. Hey, we, I haven't, you know, they've been, every day they're getting to that. Hey, uh, this is the deadline. John's meeting with this person on, you know, what is today, April 25th. Or we're meeting on with April 25th, and so we have to have the quotes. Just giving you a heads up. Can we get that in the next day? No response. Contact in the morning. No response. Here I am one more time. Just Still no response. You know, there's times in life where redundancy just seems to get really old. But what about in our prayer life? What about when it seems that our God has called us to continue to pray one more time? What about when it seems like we ought to be doing this thing one more time? What about when the thing God says, do this, and we've done it, and it doesn't seem to get the results we want, but we know that we're supposed to do it again, and again, we haven't gotten the results that we're supposed to get. And, and uh, when is it that we finally stop and say, I, I don't know that I can do this one more time? Well, look at the, uh, the steps of, the steps of, I only have two points this morning, but each of them have three side points, so I'll give you a heads up there. The steps of the, one more time. Here we begin in verse 1 of chapter 23. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered one on every altar, a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by that burnt offering, and I will go, peradventure the Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place. Now let me explain in verse 3. 
that poor adventure the Lord will come to meet me is not meaning that they assume because they've done the seven altars and ultimately 14 animals that God is obligated to come speak to him. Uh, but the terminology there, and even in the English, it doesn't seem to make sense. The poor adventure is not so much we're hoping we did enough and he'll be happy, but it's the reality of God's not obligated. He's already spoken, and uh, that may just be what it is. But we're going to put ourselves in a position ready to receive should he respond. Verse 4, And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars. This is Balaam speaking to God. Can you imagine Balaam? Can you imagine yourself just saying, Hey, God, this is what I've done. Oh, and God's surprised. Hey, I didn't realize this. I prepare seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he, he stood by his burnt offering, or burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and saith, Balak, the king of Moab, hath besought, or brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed, or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Seems to indicate that from where he is standing, he's able to see a quarter of the entirety of the nation of Israel. And he's saying, of the parts that I can see, knowing it's only a, a section of them. How can you even number that part of them? Let me die the death of righteousness, lest my end be like his. What is Balaam saying? Hey, these people are so great. Keep in mind in the Hebrew, in the kind of the ancient language of our Old Testament, they really did not have a word that would even describe beyond a thousand. You know, I don't, what do we have? I, there's, what is a gazillion? <laughs> you know, what, what's the top number that we have? I know there's a name for it, but there's a top number to that pretty much we max out in our numbering system. Back in these days, it was a thousand. So when you see in the Old Testament, when it says tens of thousands, that doesn't literally mean 10 or 20,000. That means this is beyond a thousand, so far beyond, we don't even have a number for it. And so they're looking at, if you call, call the children of Israel are about a million people. So they're looking at a quarter of that is 250,000 people. That's beyond their capacity to number. And he points that out. They're like, the duh, how do we even number them? And this is just a section of them. How do we number them? And he concludes with verse 10 by ultimately saying, I hope to die blessed like they are blessed. This <laughs> is ultimately... How, how do you say that to the king that wants you to curse? My goal is to live such a life that I will be blessed like those people are going to be blessed. And the king's sitting there saying, I thought I was paying you to curse them. And Balaam said unto Balaam, and I love verse 11, What have you done? <laughs> what have you done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them all together. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, and, and, uh, and meet me unto another place, from whence thou mayest see them, thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and thou shalt not see them all, and curse me them from thence. So here's attempt number one, we're just concluding, and uh, the result is a blessing instead of a curse, and he acknowledges he can't even number them. Here's attempt number two. What is going to change with attempt number two? Already in the verse I just read, in verse 13, what is Balak doing in attempt number two to help things perhaps go his way? Um, let's go to another spot, a second spot, where you won't see as many of them. Could you imagine acknowledging that? Could you imagine being so bold as a king? Oh, so the problem is you see too many of them, and you know that it's going to be an impossibility to curse them all. You know you're seeing a quarter of them, and it's still way too many. Let's just take you to a spot where, let's say you can only see a hundred. Maybe it will be easier for you. How does that make sense? How, how, how does that make He already knows yes. that there's an unlimited, as the dust of the earth, number of people. But Balak has assumed that if I can get you to a new position where you can only see 100 people, maybe you'll be more eager to curse them if your vantage point is only a small group instead of the 25% that I'm showing you now. How almost ridiculous that is. But let's stop right there. How often do we do that in our own 
a childish attempt with our God? Wait, God, you don't, maybe you don't understand what I'm facing. Maybe you don't understand what I'm going through. Maybe you don't understand my situation. Let me kind of break it down for you in smaller sections so you can understand. And I don't know that we'd ever come to the point of the boldness of Balak where we're, uh, uh, we're admitting uh, our, our boldness in that regard. Uh, but how often do we do that with our God? He seems to have said no, and yet we say, well, let me break it down a little farther for you. Let me make it even more uh, simplified so that you can understand where I'm coming from. It's literally what Balak is doing here. And he brought him onto the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. Now, I know that although it says he, this is not Balak actually building altars, I would got to say, and it's not Balak actually sacrificing the animals. He has people. <laughs> He's got folks that are doing this for him. Uh, but can you imagine building seven more altars? These aren't something that you can just throw together. Now, again, if you look at the pictures from that area, you can look at the pictures uh, of where AJ is right now. You know that uh, there's, a, there's plenty of rocks. So it wouldn't take a long time to build an altar, but we're building seven of them. And uh, there's going to be some involvement here. But here they are building the seven more. And not only that, that they've slaughtered another 14 animals. And he says on the Balak, stand here by the burnt offering while I meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and say thus. When he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him again. Nothing has changed there. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. Now I think there's another difference. This is one more in the positive light than in the uh, negative light on this uh, second attempt. By the initial words of Balaam to Balak, it was, hey, <laughs> no, here's Balak. What did God say? Did he change his mind? <laughs> you have a curse now because you only saw 10 people instead of 250,000? Uh, uh, did this change the whole the outcome of what I'm hoping for? So what did he say? Can you imagine being Balaam? Well, let me tell you what God first said. He says, listen up! <laughs> I am speaking! I have spoken! Listen! Do! Understand! And, and it's almost like God is kind of, uh, uh, kind of maybe proverbially smacking him in the face saying, hey, listen, I've already spoken. It is. It can't be undone now. It is and I have spoken. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do? Or hath he spoken, and shall it not be made good? In other words, God, God's not going to suddenly curse those whom he's blessed. We're, we're changing a spot and seeing fewer people isn't going to change that because God is still God. And, and this, is not, this is not how it works. Be sold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He had not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen per persever perverseness in Israel. And the Lord is his God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Who is interesting about verse 21? Let me go back to the days of Aaron. How many times have the children of Israel murmured and complained? How many times has Moses gone before God and said, How long do I have to endure this? You know how many times God has replied and said, I am just going to wipe them off. Get out of the way. I'm going to destroy them all. And I think this is a great, again, we're not the children of Israel. We are not Israelites. We, the blessings upon Israel do not fall upon the church today. But we are still his children today, and we are able to enjoy some of those blessings that are given to us as his children, as we are adopted uh, into his family. You know, isn't it an amazing wonder that as God sees us, as Paul the Cross describes in Colossians chapter 1, we are declared holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Who among us is worthy of that? Who among us can say, I, yeah, God sees me as holy. Yeah, I understand that. That makes sense. <laughs> Who among us can say, yeah, God sees me as unblameable. There's, there's nothing that he can, he can point a finger at me. Yeah, I, I deserve that. I can understand how he concludes that. And, you know, I'm glad that God thinks the way I do. Now, who among us can say that there's nothing that God can, that he can hold me back and say, you don't deserve what I'm going to give you. Who among us can say, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think God's right on there. He's, he's, he's come to the right conclusions here. 
You know, there's not a, I would hope there's not a single one of us that would say, I am deserving of being called holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. But that's how God sees us. So do we marvel at that? Do we marvel at what was accomplished on the cross that we who are yet still sinners, not in bondage to our sin because we're his children and we've, we are victorious in him, but we still continue to sin. But God continues to see us as his own. We ought to marvel. And when verse 21 says, he had not beheld iniquity in Jacob, I want to scratch my head and say, what? <laughs> what? These murmuring, complaining people that you've tried to strike down numerous times, it wasn't that long ago that you struck them with a plague. It wasn't that long ago that you allowed their enemies to come after them. It wasn't that long ago that they built a golden calf in replacement. To, it wasn't that long ago that you repented of delivering them from Egypt. Let me read that again. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. God is not senile. God is not forgetful. God is not... Just that old grandpa who just says, oh, that's all right. My, and I give you an inside story, even though my parents are here. My parents were pretty strict growing up, when we were growing up. I don't know what they were like growing up, but when I was growing up, they were pretty strict and uh, 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 pretty direct. You know, here's the rules. You do them or you, you pay the consequence. And I, I think that's how, ultimately, how parenting should be. I think it, it probably worked out. Well, maybe not so well for Bob, but for the rest of the three of us, it, it pretty much worked out for us. Um, but you know what's amazing? They don't view that anymore with their grandkids. How does that work? We're going to go to Grandma's house. Like, yeah, and Grandma's going to take care of you. She's going to hug you. She's going to blubber all over you. And, and uh, suddenly Dad becomes the enemy. How, how did, what changed? How, how, did that, how, how did that happen? Uh, and, and how many times I've said to my kids, oh, when I was growing up, let me tell you how it worked out. And they're looking at me like, yeah, it's just the same thing of when you were growing up. You had to walk barefoot up the hill all the way to school. Uh, that's how that worked. What changed here? Uh, but it, anyway, he, has be held, he hasn't been held. He, has seen, he has not seen perverseness. The Lord, the Lord is blessing them. Verse 22, God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Well, there's an interesting terminology there in the old... Uh, how, many, how many times did you hear growing up? There's no such thing as unicorns, and, and there is in the Bible. They have the strength of a unicorn. Well, this seems to be, in fact, the unicorn, although it has the, in, the, in English, it has the uni, which often means one. It, it literally is a word that means an animal with a horn, and it actually could mean an animal with horns. Uh, it is often believed, though, that this probably is something along the lines of a rhinoceros. Uh, something that perhaps they would have been more accustomed to back in the era or the, the area of, of Egypt and beyond. Uh, but it, it seems to be a general term of an animal with a horn, and obviously it has to do with a, an animal that has of, of great strength, an unstoppable animal with a, a mighty defensive and offensive uh, instrument in the front of its head. Surely... There is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Now, time out. What kind of courage does Balaam have to say that to the king who hired him to curse them? These people are like a lion. They're like this animal that has got tremendous strength with a horn on its head. But they're like a lion, and not just a lion, but even a young lion that has endless strength. That is not going to stop until he's even licked up the blood of all of the enemies. And, and the king's got to be sitting there thinking, what? And Balaam said unto Balaam, neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. In other words, what, what is Balaam or Balak saying right here in verse 25? Just keep your mouth shut. Keep it shut. If you can't curse them, keep your mouth shut so you're not blessing them. It's almost, you bless them in the first attempt. We take you to another spot, which I think is going to be better, and you wind up blessing them even more. And in essence, putting a greater curse on me as King Balak. Just keep your mouth shut. Don't, don't speak. You, know, you can just imagine. Stop it. 
A Balaam answered. <laughs> Again, this guy is my hero. I, I don't know that he was as righteous as sometimes we make him out to be because I know of how he dies, and it is not, certainly not a time of righteousness in his part anyway. But this guy amazes me. Verse 26. The guy, the king, the king, with all of his men there with him, has just basically told him, keep your mouth shut. And Balaam answers. The guy that can't keep his mouth shut. And said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. Peradventure it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor that looketh toward uh, Jeshimon. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. Again, can you imagine the, is that a simple mind? Is that a determination? Is that just a, I'm not going to stop until I get my way? Is it a, I am so scared to death that I will continue going on because without and even an attempt, I am doomed? Why does the king take him to a third spot for attempt number three? In fact, when it says that he's taking him up to uh, the top of pure, that look at toward Jeshimon. This is a location that is ultimately the prime headquarters of, of Baal. This is the top of the top. If, if we were a Catholic church, he's, he's taking them to spot number one. Maybe it's one of the uh, uh, diocese places. And then he's taking them maybe to, I don't know where it is. Is that D.C.? Maybe one of the most prestigious uh, uh, Catholic uh, uh, establishments here in the nation. When we come to verse 28, he's taking them to Rome. Again, if we're Catholic. He's taking them to the top of the top. He's taking them to the only the elites of the elites are involved in this spot. The other two were some spectacular locations, some spectacular views, but this is the top of the top. Let me take you to this one last spot and be ready to be awe-inspired. That's where we conclude with verse 20, or chapter 23. Behold, Balaam, verse, or chapter 24, verse 1, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face towards the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in its tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up this parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, and hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are, they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of, of a line lows which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than a gog, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt, and he hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Here we go again. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He couch, he laid him down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall sit him up? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses these. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. In other words, he's already said, <clears throat> stop, keep your mouth closed. If you're not going to curse them, stop blessing them. Literally what we have here in verse 10 is the, stop it. <laughs> I had it off. And he sends him on his way. Get out of here. You know, here on this third attempt, really the only a, a difference, and I thought should be difference number three because I already have two on the top there. We're going to take him to a more spiritual place. And I think I mentioned this last week, but why is it when we're trying to get our own way, do we try to spiritualize everything why is it when we're trying to get the Lord to see things the way we see them, uh, to try to get the Lord to go with what we are hoping he will go for, that, that we do this whole uh, little song and dance before God, that if I can make it sound spiritual, things will be okay. Well, clearly there was a futile attempt here in uh, let's do this one more time. And we can see the, the, the reasonings here because changing to a different view will make this it so it's less distracting. That, that, God doesn't, that, that's not how God works. 
Uh, obviously, we need to be getting a better view of God, but how many times is it because God has to show us what happened here? But in our minds, we have a, 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 a low, decreasing view of our God. There's a reason why ba- Balaam had to come back and say, hey, this is what God says. I've already spoken. So pay attention. Because as we're doing our attempt, we're seeing less of God and more of us. More of our situation. We become tunnel vision on our scenario that we are hoping for, and we're seeing less of God. And so that, that's not changing. That, that's not what God is saying, hey, persevere and endure here. When we begin to think, let's, let's, make this, let's simplify this so God understands what I'm going through. No, that's not how this works. When we say I, I, um, our, our attitudes, our focus, our motivations are becoming less focused on our God and more focused on me and what I need, that, that, that's not going to change anything. God's not going to say, oh, well, now I see. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you out on that. And when we begin to spiritualize even our sinfulness, can you imagine? He brings them to the, the, the highest plane of, or the highest sacrificial place of the Baal, as if, well, God's going to do something now because look at where he is. How often at times Christians, us in general, often sadly do the same thing. I'm going to keep persevering. I'm going to keep attempting it. But, but we're not doing what God's called us to do. The steps of the one more time. We can say the steps of the, the bad cases of the one more time. Kind of using this as a, a, a springboard. And we want to look at some of the dangers here in closing. Several key passages from the New Testament that I think will help tie everything together. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The tense in the Greek there is a, a tense that has an action that continues to go on. So literally, the correct interpretation or correct translation of that verse is ask and continue to ask and it shall be given unto you seek and continue seeking and you shall find knock and continue knocking and it shall be opened unto you i remember in uh, uh my fr- my freshman year of college in, in pensacola i was a part of a, a group that went to the uh what would we call that kind of a, a, a government housing area and there was some there were some tough dudes there and uh, before we would we would hold a kids program in the park, but we'd have to go around to all these houses. They're kind of almost looked like it may have been at one time like barracks because they're like barrack style. So it may have been you know there's a big base there in Pensacola. It may have been government housing at one point that was converted into uh, uh, community housing is, is how it looked to me anyway. So you go to all these like barrack looking styled houses, and uh, some of them you I'd been there before, and we knew that you know there were three kids that had a blast last week, and so you knock on the door, hey, we're back. And the kids are all excited. But there was definitely houses that you knew you didn't want to knock very loud. But you also knew that they were expecting, you know, as a college, as our group, we were expecting that we were going to knock on all the doors. So it's one of those, don't hear that, don't hear that, no, don't hear that, don't hear that. Five, four, three, two, one. Next! <laughs> and you move on. Because I don't want to talk to the person that's going to come to this door. It just looks bad. It looks evil. It looks like they might kill me. I have to knock because that's kind of why I'm here, but please don't hear. Or, or yeah, we always loved it when they had the music playing really loud because then you could just go, well, I tried. Moving on. <laughs> because, frankly, there were some people there that lived there that they were frightening. And it might be last week we were there and we saw a whole group of them and they are obviously up to no good and things were not uh, uh, pleasing to the Lord in any means and... Now they're not outside like they were last week. They're inside. And, uh, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, next one. <laughs> I know there's kids next door. Let's go over there and, and uh, we'll be a better outcome. We you know the, the, the truth is, is here we have asking and seeking and knocking and the continuation of it. So the question would be, was Balak justified in that he kept asking and seeking and knocking? Was, was he justified in that? Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 10, expounds kind of on Matthew 7. Seems to make it a little stronger, and uh, we'll get to this here in a moment, but again, was Balak justified? In Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, men are supposed to pray, and the illustration is given of a widow who just kept asking and asking and asking until finally the judge, who is described as a wicked judge, responds. Is that what Balak is doing here? Is he justified in his Attempt one, attempt two, attempt three. Are we justified in our attempt one, attempt two, attempt three? Based on Luke chapter 18. Hey, here's how you ought to pray. 
And Christ gives us illustration of this dear widow who's being oppressed. And she goes to a judge and says, please deliver me. And the judge says, nope, not doing it. She goes back to him and says, please deliver me. Nope, not doing it. Again and again and again. She goes and says, please deliver me. And he says, no. And finally he says, all right, you're starting to annoy me. I'll do it. But not because I think you're right, but because you're annoying the daylights out of me and I know you won't stop asking, I will do it. Now, some can conclude and say, so the Lord is telling us to keep annoying him uh, until he does what we are asking him to do, right? Well, we need to go back to Matthew chapter 7 very quickly here. And uh, I already read the, the verses there. Seek, or ask, and seek, and knock. Matthew chapter 7, 7. This is a, uh, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 is part of the Sermon on the Mount, correct? Mm -hmm. Who is the Sermon on the Mount delivered to? The people, is correct. That would be the correct answer. It involved the disciples, but there are obviously others there that seem to be listening as well. Let me make it even more broad. Who was the book of Matthew written to? Jews. The Jews, yes. And for the most part, those that are listening to this sermon that goes in Matthew three chapters worth is to the Jews. What were the Jews looking for? The Messiah. The, the Messiah. They were looking more specifically for the Messiah to come to a reign on David's throne, correct? They were looking for the kingdom. That's why the disciples kept that. Is now the time you're going to set up the kingdom? Uh, he was looking for, put it in the terminology that we might understand, they're looking for the millennial reign of Christ. Yes. Right now. Is this, is this the time? And so the Sermon on the Mount is spoken to those who are searching, 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 they're searching for the millennial kingdom. They're searching for the kingdom of Christ. They're searching for the time when Christ will sit on the throne of David. In their minds, they estimated it would be right there in Jerusalem, right then, right now. Here he is. If he is the Messiah, he's going to be sitting here, and he's going to run out Rome, and all will be well. The Jews are still looking for that time when Christ will sit on the throne of David, correct? Yes. The message of the Sermon on the Mount then applies to, because it's before the cross, the time frame of the Old Testament law, when Christ speaks of obedience of the law, he hasn't died yet. He hasn't ushered in the church age. He hasn't ushered in, ushered in as we call it, the age of grace. They are still living under the, the ramifications of the law. So when Christ says, do this, do this, do this, it's not necessarily an application of the church today, but it's an application for them then. They were under the law still. The law had not been fulfilled yet. Christ was there to fulfill it, but it had not been fulfilled yet. But as well, so a lot of the Sermon on the Mount is for that era, based on the Mosaic law, looking forward to when he would actually sit on the throne. And there's a lot of instances of the kingdom of God will be as. The kingdom of God will be as. The kingdom of God will be as in this sermon. Because he's reminding them, hey, you're under the law and we're looking for this time frame, but here's what is yet to come. And so when he mentions these words that we know so familiar to us, I'm still on the wrong page here. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be open. Certainly it has that connotation of, hey, Jews, there's going to be a time, this is kind of addressing in the context there, that things are going to be, not going to be going well for you. Don't give up. Don't give up. The kingdom is still coming. Don't give up we really kind of are wrong when we take this especially in the tense of the continue asking and continue seeking and continue knocking and we make it an application to us in the church age for us today to get what we want that's really not what it's specifically saying uh, because talking to a whole different people and a whole uh, i have it there yeah we need the number one we need to know the situation and here's the situation not necessarily for us we are still told to endure. We're still told Paul speaks much about persevering to running the race, to finishing the fight, uh, the, the completing the course. So there is endurance that is required of us. But this asking and seeking and knocking is addressed in this case to the Jews who are longing for the kingdom of God that has yet to be established. But don't give up. It's still coming. Don't give up. Luke chapter 11 seems to be kind of a... Uh, a a parallel passage of sorts of, of, the, of the same circumstance. Luke doesn't quite expound on it as much. And it says here in verse 2, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, and here we have the Lord's Prayer, which is also included on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. 
Uh, let me jump ahead. Which of you, verse 5, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto thee, though he will not rise and give him, because of he his, is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given unto you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened unto him. Let me continue on. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him, for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye be then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? What is Christ speaking here? As Luke's kind of combining in a very short section, basically three chapters of Matthew. The, re the reminder here at the beginning of, of the friend, what would you say? Yes, yes. This isn't about us. This is about him, is it not? This is, this is about him. Hey, here's the illustration. Here's how you ought to pray. Let me give you an illustration as it comes to friends. Your neighbor gets a late night visitor and, and they're hungry and you have nothing to feed them. They come and knock on your door and, and you say as that neighbor, hey, it's late. I'm tired. My kids are already in bed. Don't bother me. It's not an indication that this friend wouldn't give them what they needed tomorrow morning. Right. Come back in the morning. I'll give you everything you want. I'll give you a feast. But right now is not the right time. But what does it say as a friend? He will, in due time, get up and give you what you need, not because of the friendship, but because you keep asking, because of, yeah, because he knows that this is a great need of yours and you're not going to go away until you can get it resolved. And so on that basis, he will get up. He continues the very same scenario then with, which of you as a father would give your kid a stone because he asked for bread or why would a father give a scorpion or a serpent when he's looking for fish? Well, you know, that, that doesn't make sense. And then he calls and reminds us, you who are evil, you wouldn't do that. So why do you think your God will? So the whole emphasis here of Luke chapter 11, Luke has kind of uh, tweaked it and put the emphasis back on our God and, and points out that this, doesn't, this is not a correlation. This is not a continue being that that person who's going to continue asking, hey, I need some food to give to my guests because that's how God operates. This is not a, hey, I've asked for a fish and I know you're not going to give me a scorpion for it. That, that's not what is being said here. What is being said here is if you as humans know how this works, then consider you're God who is not human, who doesn't operate on the same terms as we do. Consider how different that is. So secondly, we need to know our God. When I continue to ask and ask and ask and ask, there are times that we are to ask and ask and ask and ask. And there are times that we come to, before God day after day and petition before him, Lord, I, I just need you to work this out. And I need you to, you know, our prayer requests to those who are going through cancer. Why we just ask for your healing in this area? But we need to understand that, number one, some of the verses that we use to justify our asking and asking and asking really actually don't apply to us. So understand that. Secondly, we need to understand that there's a lot of times that it's our God that is what the focus is, not us, not our needs but our God. Luke chapter 18, a few, few pages away here, and then we can close. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 through 8. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in the city a judge who feared not God, neither regarded man. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man. What a thing for a judge to say. I fear that there are cases in our judicial system where we have men like that in service who ought not to be. You, I, I acknowledge that I have no fear for God and I have no regard for man. Well, then you shouldn't be a judge. But no, no, first five. Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. The Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Shall not the God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith, faith on the earth. What is the time frame again of this passage? Not necessarily our time frame. We're, we're looking towards, you know, 
especially in the terminology of, of the Jews, we're looking more towards a, a, a kingdom time frame. But the principle is still here. Hey, again, this is not just about God. We need to understand a, a timing. We understand, understand who he is and what he is doing and what is he accomplishing. And, and the, the truth is, is, and I love how it concludes there, when he comes, will faith be found on this earth? That's the point. When he comes, it's not about, well, I got this, this, and this, and this. But when he comes, will we still be found faithful here on this earth? There are other passages we could go to, and I'm already late, and so we won't go to those other passages. But you know, the, the truth is, is a big significance between Balak and what we often go through as well. Did Balak already get a no answer? Balak got a no answer before he even petitioned God. When Balaam first arrived on the scene, he said, I will only curse if God gives me the words to curse. And I will bless if God gives you the words to bless. He pretty much got a no there. It was a no to the point of, I'm not just going to curse because you're paying me. It's whatever God says. When the first time he comes back and God, and God makes it very clear, God says, I'm going to bless these people. What does Balak do? Well, let's try it one more time. Comes back, well, I'm going to bless them even more. And I'm going to really ultimately then curse you. What does Balak say? Well, let me try this one more time. Here's the point. He had the answer. He had the answer. It was a no answer. But like a spoiled child, he continued to ask. There is a point that we are to endure. There is a point that we are to continue on. There is a reality of prayer that we are to keep on praying and praying and praying. There, there's that reality. We pray sometimes for the same request week after week for that very reason. But when God has answered, when God has made it clear in his word, this is what I'm going to do, it's, it's kind of futile on our part to continue praying for that which he's already given an answer. And at that point, we cross the line and we become no different than a spoiled child who says, this isn't about you, God. This isn't about my faith in you, God. This isn't about your majesty and your honor and your glory. This is about me, I want, and I need to get. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it needs to happen now. And in those cases, God says, all right, your, your perseverance, your endurance, you're enduring for the wrong thing. You're, you're, you're persevering in the wrong areas. Stop it. I, I, I don't want to put the, the human terminology to our, our God because I don't think we should put human terminology to our God. But it's almost like uh, what Balak does. <laughs> Does our God sometimes say, stop, keep your mouth shut, stop, stop opening your mouth because what is coming out isn't right, it's not good. Now, I don't want to put human terms to our God, but sometimes in my human mind, I think there's got to be times that our God, even to me, says, Newtorn, just keep your mouth shut. I've already told you, just stop. And Paul obviously experienced the, hey, we're done here. But what did Paul do? Because he had the right directions. He knew the situation. He knew his God. And he knew the timing. I've, I've, I've brought it before my God. My God said, no, I rejoice in his no. I rejoice in infirmities. I glory in my infirmities. Why? Because I understand that his grace is always greater than my problems. And I know now my God better than I did before. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. We thank you for the fact that you are a God that does not change. We thank you for the example of Balaam and Balak here. I pray that we be able to see in our own hearts how often we become like spoiled children, just continuing to ask and ask and ask, perhaps persevering as we're challenged to do, but persevering in the wrong ways, persevering in the wrong areas. And I just pray that you would direct our hearts, quiet our hearts, soften our hearts, that we might be able to understand you, that we might be able to see you, that we might be living to the praise of your honor and to your glory, not for our own wants and our own needs and our own desires and what we think we have to have. I pray that we live for you. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.